By the way, thank you, Elias, so much for saying it's all speculative fiction. Um, that's much better than what I said before, and I'm very comfortable with that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, okay, we're going in line. Um, uh, so, um, I write speculative fiction, and the first piece takes place in a future world 100 years ago, and the second book I wrote takes place 100 years in the past. Um, and both of them are speculative, and both of them deal with, I think, um, stories that haven't been told that we don't know about. And when I go into the past, um, I'm interested, I'm a theater person, so I'm interested in like performers and who they are and what they do. Um, so the performers I'm looking at in the past are minstrel performers and Wild West Show performers and uh, the Native Americans and African Americans who did that stuff. And it's almost impossible to find any first person accounts about how they felt about doing that stuff. So I have to speculate, uh, particularly about the women. That doesn't count, that's normal writing. Oh, no, no, no. That's no. speculative. Oh, totally. I decide, you know, because we've lost all of this stuff. We've lost huge amounts of stuff. Um, particularly, the film stock dissolved. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's gone. There's no way to get at it at all. Um, so to me, um, I decided that I'm going to invent someone who made one of those films. And she's a hoodoo. Um, and she does all of, you know, the... All, the uh, all, all performers uh, have magic. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you like to listen to them and not the people who aren't performers. <laughs> and so, um, Conjurers who call up in front of you a whole different world without costume or, or makeup or lights or anything. That's what the actor has, and I'm fascinated by that. So between those two things, between hoodoo and acting and like film that dissolved, I decided to speculate on those people. Uh, between, you know, like I am now chief you know, big chief dum dum, and I'm riding my horse, and I'm in Chicago on a back lot. So I wanted to, you know, like, and then you go home, and who are you? Um, so I, that's what my current book, Redwood and Wildfire, is about. About performers from Georgia who are magical because they're performers, because they do hoodoo. They come to a city, a big city in the north, and it's the same as 2011, but it's 1911. <laughs> in terms of what they face, in terms of all the things that I found when I tried to do research. So I was fascinated by that. I was like, things don't change, but then things do change because I'm getting to write this. And, um, you know, <laughs> so it's like, whoa! So that cone really worked for me, like change and not change. And I wanted to wrestle with it. And that to me is one of the, the rehearsals of the impossible. That yeah, that's I actually, do. I like you saying that because uh, I heard a great line, Elia, you might remember it better than I do, but maybe not. Ted Chang, who is one of the Nebula Award nominees um, this year, and somebody was talking about how, oh, 100 years ago, you know, none of us, what was it, like none of us would have been alive or because we'd all have died from, you know, childhood illnesses and, or something, but Ted Chang said, I'm totally mastering this anecdote. Nobody else has heard this story? No. And Ted Chang said, well, I wouldn't be writing and I wouldn't be published. But the, the point being that, yeah. you know, that we were saying, like, as, you know, happy Western white people or even, you know, the educated Western black people, you know, we, we would and still have been up against it and Ted saying, I wouldn't even no. be allowed to speak. Right. And I, I really wanted to, you know, deal with my grandparents' generation because I whine a lot about how hard it is. And I thought, oh, crap, like, face this. And that's a great challenge as a writer. Face this and do something. Not just whine, do something. What are you going to do? Like, make something happen. Like, you're going to put on a show. Go do it. And so that was what my character had to do. And I had to work and had to find. And she was a hoodoo. So I gave her magic power and it was still hard. <laughs> and they won't let her, you know, and that's still going on today. So, um, you know, that, that um, power doesn't necessarily mean you can move the, the nature of the world that you find yourself in. So how do you deal with that? And that was the question I wanted to and ask. And I just realized that I have finally managed to ask in a really great way the question that I hate the most because it's the question my mom asks me, which is, this is also, why can't you write about real things. <laughs> why can't you write real books and real stories? You know, there's, why do you have to write this magic crap? And that's a question I um, always find very difficult to answer, but I think I just snuck it in under all of you. Carlos, what's your answer? Well, I'm like, that's exactly where I was going to lead in, and I think you 
set me up perfectly because all fiction is speculative yeah. fiction. It's right. all right. about speculation. Thank it's you. all what if. It's all putting yeah. a thought experiment into yes. play. It's just that speculative fiction writers are the most Ouch. honest about it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's the lie that makes the truth then possible. Yeah. And so, and, and I, I want to say that by the way that uh, I, I, my background is Cuban, and uh, I can not write domestic realism in a way that will seem like domestic realism to an American audience. <laughs> realism is only what you are willing wait, 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 to be. Wait. I, I actually, I've heard this story and I want you to tell it. So, well, let's see if it's this one. Uh, so, a um, couple years ago, I go back for Christmas to visit my family, and when I enter the house, my, my two sisters across me before and say, you're not going to believe it. So, okay, I'm not going to believe it. We go in, there is a 14-foot statue of the Virgin Mary in the center of our living room. I mean, cathedral size, gorgeously painted. She is standing upon a dragon, so you really know it's her. She is there, and so we're like, what the hell is this? Well, you know, hi, how's it going? We sit down, we're drinking little cafecitos. Uh, we're, me and my two sisters just sort of so there's a there's a there's a ring at the door, bing bong. That no nobody goes to get it, but the door opens itself. And in crawls, just the clichédless, most archetypal abuelita, dressed all in black, pro mm -hmm. crawling across. The no, no one makes a move. My dad comes through and he says, you know, oh fuck, you know. Right? <laughs> And keeps kids coming on. She she crawled. Now um, there are these three, you know, Americanized Cubans sitting there drinking cups. He's going, oh, here we go. What's what's this? We're watching this happen. She goes to the Virgin Mary, crossing her head upon the dragon. She prays there. It must be two or three minutes. We're all just kind of sitting there <laughs> watching. She takes out then, without lifting her head, a wad of money, drops it into a conveniently cased place can that my mother had put there. <laughs> Crawls out without a word. Later, when my mother finally <laughs> comes back from church, what the hell is that? She's like, oh, you know, she must have had someone she needed to pray for. I can't write domestic realism <laughs> to an American audience. How the hell am I going to make sense of that in a, something other than it? So, you know, Garcia Marcus said, you know, he wasn't writing magical realism, he was just writing realism. And so, so, so what I want to say is that one of the reasons I focus specifically on science fiction is because that's the place where I can actually lie. That's the place where I can actually reach and allow my, my imagination really to, to store and, and find, find a place to speculate.